So, um, hi everybody. Um, I'm Molly Duplessane. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy for Excise and Licenses. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let the, the rest of the team introduce themselves. And um, then we'll let Ashley kick it off with a couple of, of um, introductions. So, Abby? Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Borchers. I'm a policy analyst with Excise and Licenses. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Eric Escudero. I'm the Director of Communications for the Department of Excise and Licenses. My name is Joey Pena. I'm a Cannabis Process Navigator for the Department of Excise and Licenses. And hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Kilroy. I'm the Executive Director for Excise and Licenses, and good to see all of you tonight. Thanks for making time to be here with us. Hi, everybody. I'm Reggie Newbon. I'm with the Denver City Attorney's Office representing Excise and Licenses. All right. Well, um, Molly and the team are going to go through another PowerPoint for you guys with a lot of great information. Um, and I see everyone on here. A lot of you have been to a lot of our feedback sessions. You've really been following this closely. So thank you for being here again. Um, we, you know, after a, a lot of work, we submitted our first draft publicly on um, December 7th, it was. And since that time, you know, we've had a lot of work ahead of time, but since December 7th, we've held five additional feedback sessions. I think this one is the fifth. You know, we held about five additional feedback sessions based on the information that you all gave us and the feedback we received, the reason for a feedback session. We've made a lot of changes. Um, I think Molly's got about, Molly and the team have about 15 overall, maybe more than 15 changes to present to you based on the stuff that we heard from you and the really valuable information you provided us with. And I think that really um, shows you know, the importance of this. We really are listening to what you say. It's the best way for us to make public policy to know what our stakeholders want, what our stakeholders need, and then really balance all those interests. Because as you know, people who've been on these calls, you know, different people want different things. And we're, we're making those calculations, balancing the interests. And I think we've come up with a great product and I'm really proud of the work that the team has done with your input. So thank you. Um, and so uh, continuing our, our, uh, our road, our, our process of transparency that we always engage in. And we've probably, like I said, we've got Tons of stuff on the website, tons of things for you to read and look at. Um, so continuing in that tradition, I will turn it over to Molly and the team to go over the details with you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Um, so Abby, if you want to go ahead and share the slides. Um, we'll go through a short presentation. Um, basically, and it's been online for a couple of days now, so hopefully um, you've had a chance to look at it, um, but it's going to just explain some of the changes that have been made from the first draft that was released in December. Um, and then we can have some time for public comment at the end. Um, along those lines, if you do want to provide public comment at the end of the presentation, you can use the raise hand feature um, and we'll put you in the queue and promote you to a speaker and you can turn on your video if you like um, and provide that comment. Um, we'll allow for two minutes per person to provide that public comment um, and to make sure that we can get through everybody. Um, if you are, there are questions within your comment, we'll um, save those to the end. And if we can answer them, we will. If there's time, we will. Or if we, if we need to go research something or if there's not time, uh, we will add to our Q&A that is posted online where all the questions and answers that were asked in the previous sessions are posted. So um, stay tuned for that additional resource on the website as well. Um, so any questions that we're not able, not able to answer here tonight will be there. Um, okay, so to get started, um, why we're here tonight is to review the updates to the first draft of the omnibus and the hospitality bill um, and to provide continued opportunity for uh, community participation and to seek your feedback on the draft ordinance language. As Ashley said, we want to make sure that we're having this robust dialogue. There are always things that we are not thinking of or are unaware of and we received a lot of great input on the first draft over the last two months and um, wanted to you know, incorporate some of those changes and then come back to you to um, hear your feedback on those changes. Uh, so just a reminder of the bills and the legislation that we are proposing are separated into three separate bills. Um, the first one is an omnibus bill, which includes uh, the social equity program 
as well as some changes to the existing licenses. Um, some of that is just to clean up to sync with some changes that happened at the state through the sunset bill. Um, but then some other other changes are incorporated just to kind of modernize and, and get, you know, with some changes that have happened since the code really was written in 2010 and 2013. Um, you know, some changes and, and perspectives have changed since then. So we just want to make sure that we're keeping up with those changes. Um, additionally, um, an another change to an existing license is allowing and opting into marijuana delivery, um, which was a state, uh, a new license type that was adopted at the state in 2019. Um, so this is taking that opportunity to opt in and provide that new opportunity to businesses in Denver and to consumers in Denver. The second bill is a bill to enact a marijuana hospitality program. This is also a new license type that was adopted by the state in 2019. Um, and, and again, this is Denver's bill to propose opting into that new license type and a new business and consumer opportunity. Those two bills will, will be running simultaneously. And then there's a third bill um, that if, if the new marijuana hospitality program passes, then the third bill would be introduced to repeal the cannabis consumption pilot program, which was a citizen initiated ordinance um, to enact a designated consumption license. And so with a more robust program through the hospitality license, we would then repeal that old license. Uh, so just a couple of reminders and, and, all, and, and Ashley touched on a lot of this, um, so I won't spend too much time on it, but just wanna um, remind you about all the um, work that's done to get to this place uh, with all of your help really. Um, and so there was a bunch of research and um, you know, stakeholder outreach and discussions that happened prior to May and June of 2020, but it was at that time that we did assemble the marijuana licensing work group in a more formal capacity to gather input on topics of delivery, hospitality, equity, the omnibus changes. Um, and those were all discussed through a series of meetings in the spring. Um, and then one was held, a, a fifth one was held in September as well. Um, throughout the summer and then the fall as well, um, we spent a lot of time working with the city attorney's office, drafting the bills, revising, tweaking, getting really into the details of all the different uh, proposals. That led to us releasing a first draft of the proposals on December, December 7th, 2020. Um, and then what we've been doing since then is taking feedback, additional feedback on those changes or on that proposal. Um, so we held four public feedback sessions in December and January to gather input. Um, and we've briefed every council member and have had lots and lots of stakeholder meetings, um, hearing from different perspectives and ideas. And again, like I said, we don't think of everything. So it's just great to talk to people and hear their different perspectives. And they always end up highlighting something to us that we just hadn't thought of. Um, so that was happening in December and January, um, taking us to today uh, where, uh, uh, well, so the last week or so where we released a second draft of the proposal, again, incorporating a lot of those changes that we heard through that stakeholder feedback um, and the meeting tonight where we're presenting the changes uh, from the first draft. And at the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about next steps, but um, we are scheduled to go to the first city council committee to present this um, on March 2nd. So um, with that, I will pass it over to Joey. Hi, thanks, Molly. So as we're talking about some of our proposed changes, we've made some updates to our proposed fees. And this is a part of our ongoing efforts to provide additional supports for uh, future social equity applicants. Um, so you'll notice on this slide that we have proposed um, eliminating application fees for some of our license types. Um, and and reducing those from, um, for example, for a medical marijuana business license type from 1,000 to zero, or for a medical marijuana off-premise storage facility from 500 to zero. So this um, table kind of gives you a better understanding of where we've made some additional um, some additional reductions. Uh, or waivers for fees, particularly for social equity applicants. Um, and just a note on that is that the fees listed above are, are for the city and county of Denver. These are the fees that we set. Um, there may be additional fees that are set by the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division that are distributed to local jurisdictions. And then just as a part of 
our ongoing outreach and education. Um, we work with social equity applicants and, and we'll continue to work with them to kind of determine what the fee structures will look like as you're going through the licensing process. Another change that's notable um, is in our updated omnibus bill, uh, we are adding an additional um, reporting uh, requirement to the city council. So in the first draft, uh, section 6210D, the director shall report in writing to city council by July 1, 2023 of, on the operation of the delivery program. We've added in the new draft um, that we would maintain that provision in 6210D and then add 6 206 C, the director shall report in writing to city council by July 1, 2026, regarding the exclusive issuance of certain licenses to social equity applicants. This is really, I think, um, by reporting to the city council uh, a year before the exclusivity period for other license types expires, the department and city council can assess whether the exclusivity period needs to be extended and whether any other adjustments need to be made to the program. Um, of course, throughout the, the span of this program, we're going to be doing consistent monitoring and evaluation um, to ensure that um, we're adequately responding to any changes that may be made at the state or federal levels. Um, and, and really that this is um, the language that we've included in the new draft is additional accountability for us um, to, to report back to the city council to ensure that the program is effective and that it's, it's working and, and better serving our social equity licensees. We've also added a provision on transfers of ownership. Um, so in the first draft of our omnibus bill, 6219B, licenses held by social equity applicants except marijuana transporter licenses shall be transferable either to other social equity applicants or non-social equity applicants upon approval by the director. We've made some adjustments in the new draft to say in 6219B, prior to July 1, 2027, any licenses held by social equity applicants shall be transferable either to other social equity applicants or non-social equity applicants, so long as 51% or more of the license is held by one or more social equity licensees. After July 1st, 2027, licenses held by social equity applicants shall be transferable either to other social equity applicants or non-social equity applicants upon approval by the director. This change is really responding to stakeholder concerns about maintaining the integrity of our social equity program by keeping social equity licenses under ownership of social equity applicants. This requirement is intended to prevent non-social equity applicants from buying out social equity applicants majority share in their licenses before the exclusivity period is over, while still allowing social equity applicants um, the ability to transfer up to 49% of their license to non-social equity applicant investors in order to raise capital. Um, this is really based on some of the feedback that we've heard about the maintaining the integrity of our program and also um, protecting from some predatory practices that social equity licensees may be vulnerable to. And then um, in section 6207A and 6, 222C2, we're addressing social impact plans. Um, so in the first draft of our up, of our omnibus bill, um, we had said that all applications for local licensing shall be made in the manner provided by the director. In addition to information required by chapter 32 of this code, the application shall contain the following information, a social impact plan containing the information required by the director. And in 6222C2, we reference the social impact plan again to say that the social impact plan submitted at renewal shall also identify outcomes resulting from the social impact plan in place during the previous licensing year. In the new draft 6207A1, a social impact plan containing the information required by the director, as well as the following. This is really designed to provide some more direction um, and, and additional requirements to make these plans more clear and to include specific metrics. It's also worth noting that this information, a uh, version of this information exists now for research and development licenses, um, but in 
In essence, what it requires is that the social impact plan would contain the name, telephone number, and email address of the person affiliated with the applicant or licensee who's responsible for oversight and implementation of the social impact plan, a description of the procedure or procedures the applicant or licensee will use to timely address concerns of residents, registered neighborhood organizations, and businesses within the neighborhood surrounding the license premise, a list of all registered neighborhood organizations whose boundaries encompass the location of the license premise, and a description of the applicant or licensee's plan to engage with each registered neighborhood or association, a description of the applicant or licensee's diversity and inclusion practices in hiring and employment, including any specific metrics to be used in measuring the success of its programs, a description of the applicant or licensee's sustainability practices, including any specific metrics to be used in measuring the success of its programs, a description of the applicant or licensee's plan to foster participation in the regulated marijuana industry by people from communities that have been previously disproportionately harmed by marijuana prohibition and enforcement in order to positively impact those communities, including any specific metrics to be used in measuring the success of its programs and a description of how members of the public can access the applicant's social impact plan. And then with 622C2, the change that we've outlined is that the social impact plan submitted at the renewal show also identify outcomes resulting from the social impact plan in place during the previous licensing year using the specific metrics identified in the social impact plan for measuring the success of its programs. This is really to provide some more accountability, more transparency, more clarity, and, and really to provide those specific metrics so that we see more success for these, these social impact plans. In the updated omnibus bill draft, you'll also notice a change regarding security. In the first draft of our bill, 6209A3, beginning July 1, 2021, medical and retail marijuana stores shall install and use a secure safe and a limited access area, which shall be incorporated into the building structure or securely attached thereto for overnight storage of cannabis and cash. In the new draft, 6209A3, this changes the date beginning October 1st, 2021, medical and retail marijuana stores shall install and use a safe in a limited access area, which shall be incorporated into the building structure or securely attached thereto for overnight storage of all processed cannabis and cash. For marijuana infused products that must be kept refrigerated or frozen, the establishment may lock the refrigerated container or freezer so long as the appliance is affixed to the building structure. The director may approve security devices such as vaults and strong rooms that are functionally equivalent to safes. And then we have from the first draft to the new draft, we have additionally added a definition of safe. Um, in 6204.19, safe means a metal box capable of being locked securely, constructed in a manner to prevent opening by human or mechanical force or through the use of common tools, including but not limited to hammers, bolt cutters, crowbars, or pry bars. So these changes just provide that additional clarity on how licensees can comply with this requirement, and it provides additional time for our licensees to come into compliance. In the updated omnibus bill draft, we've also, um, in the first draft, the, the first draft was silent on walk-up, drive-up, and curbside service. In the new draft, 6209A4, we have clarified that medical and retail marijuana stores shall not provide walk-up or drive-up window service or curbside pickup. All transactions must occur within a licensed premise. A medical or retail marijuana store may provide for walk-up or drive-up window service or curbside service pursuant to and in compliance with an emergency rule promulgated by the state licensing authority. The explanation for this is that the change clarifies that drive-up, walk-up, and curbside service are currently allowed pursuant to an emergency rule promulgated by the state licensing authority. Allowances for drive up, walk up and curbside service were initially intended to facilitate social distancing during the COVID-19 during the COVID pandemic, especially as marijuana businesses were not allowed to deliver in most jurisdictions. Now that Denver plans to implement marijuana delivery and as the pandemic subsides, these measures may be unnecessary in the long term to protect public health and additional analysis and stakeholder inputs required to determine whether and how to allow walk up and drive up windows permanently. Um, in general, I think we'd like to have a more robust conversation about this. Um, and so in, instead of staying silent, we've, we've added that additional clarification.
Okay. Abby. <laughs> Um, before I jump in, I just want to um, check if anyone else is having issues viewing the screen share. Um, if you are, um, let's see if we can drop a link to the presentation in the chat. Um, Molly, if you can do that, and at least folks can follow along if they can't see the screen. Okay, um, so jumping into renewal hearings. Um, in the first draft of the omnibus bill, uh, section 6222E um, contained some circumstances under which uh, the director could set a hearing on the renewal of a medical or retail marijuana business application. Um, those included um, if there's evidence that a medical or retail marijuana business has adversely impacted the health, welfare, or public safety of the neighborhood, um, the reasonable requirements of the neighborhood and desires of the adult inhabitants indicate that the store license should not be renewed, and the number and availability of other medical or retail marijuana stores in the neighborhood indicate that the store should not be renewed. Um, so after hearing uh, quite a bit of feedback from stakeholders on this requirement, um, we went back and looked at all the circumstances under which the director could require a renewal hearing, including these three, and decided to um, just create a more accurate and succinct way of capturing all of those circumstances under which the director could set a renewal hearing. Um, and so that's where that red language on the right comes in. Um, so now 6-222E, one through three have been stricken and are replaced with um, the director may set a renewal hearing for a medical or retail marijuana business application um, in accordance with the requirements of the Colorado Marijuana Code and Chapter 32 of the Denver Revised Municipal Code. If there are causes for denial, suspension, revocation, non-renewal or other licensing sanctions as provided in Chapter 32 of this code, this Article 5 or rules and regulations promulgated there too. So again, this change just um, is more comprehensive and also more succinct way of capturing all of those circumstances when the director could set a renewal hearing but is not required to. Also an update in the omnibus bill is um, an addition to the causes for denial section. So 6-223A4 was unintentionally omitted from the first draft. And so it has been added back in. Um, that's that language in red on the right. Um, so now it reads that in addition to the grounds set forth in the Colorado Marijuana Code and chapter 32 of this code, any application submitted pursuant to this article five shall be denied if a second or additional license to the same applicant would have the effect of restraining competition. Um, this cause for denial for a new license application, this is not a cause for denial for a renewal application, just for a new application, um, currently exists in state law already, and you can see the citation there. Um, it also exists in the Denver Revised Municipal Code today. Um, so including the causes of denial that exist in state code um, just provides notice to applicants um, of all the reasons for which their license application may be denied. Um, we made a couple of changes to delivery based on stakeholder feedback. Um, so in the first draft, there was a prohibition on marijuana delivery drivers accepting cash tips from customers or patients. Um, after receiving feedback on this, we decided to strike this prohibition, um, just given that tipping can occur through a lot of different mechanisms, not just cash. And so a prohibition on cash tips um, wouldn't accomplish the goal of deterring diversion and a prohibition on all tipping would be unenforceable. And we heard some feedback that um, tipping is another source of income for people. And so we don't wanna um, prohibit folks from taking advantage of that. Another change um, is in section 6-210C. Um, previously, we had decided to align with the state on the amounts of uh, cannabis that can be in a delivery vehicle. 
Um, after receiving some feedback on safety concerns, we adjusted the language there in red. So 6-210C5 now reads that an enclosed delivery motor vehicle shall not contain more than $5,000 in retail value of cannabis and a delivery motor vehicle that is not enclosed shall not contain more than $2,000 in retail value of cannabis. So the state limit is for an enclosed vehicle is $10,000. We've reduced that to 5,000. And then the state limit is $2,000 for a non-enclosed vehicle. And we've kept that the same. So lowering the inventory limit for an enclosed delivery vehicle from 10,000 to 5,000 um, is responsive to stakeholder concerns about safety and diversion. So this change is really intended to reduce the amount of marijuana that could be diverted to the illicit market in the event that a delivery vehicle is robbed. Okay, so a couple, just one change to off-premises storage facilities um, that's really meant to align with state rules. Um, in the first draft, we had uh, prohibitions that exist currently on what uh, activities are allowed at off-premises storage facilities. Um, we've kept those prohibitions, except we've added that a marijuana store with a valid delivery permit may use its own off-premises storage facility to uh, package, label, and fill orders for delivery of marijuana to a patient or, consu or consumer after the marijuana store receives an order for delivery. So um, for off-premises storage facilities that don't have a valid delivery permit, um, they still cannot possess unsealed packages or containers of cannabis. Um, they can't open sealed packages or containers of cannabis and they can't repackage cannabis. Um, if they have a delivery permit, they can do those activities to fill orders for delivery on the premises. So again, this change just aligns with the activities that the state allows uh, on off-premises storage facility um, licensed premises. Okay, um, in the omnibus bill draft, we made one update to the definition of advertising. So in the first draft, advertising means the act of drawing the public's attention to a medical or retail marijuana business in order to promote the sale of cannabis by a medical or retail marijuana business. In the new draft, um, advertising means the act of drawing the public's attention to a medical or retail marijuana business in order to promote the sale of cannabis by a medical or retail marijuana business or consumption of marijuana in a marijuana business. This change ensures that hospitality businesses are subject to the same advertising restrictions as other marijuana businesses um, and restricting advertising of marijuana consumption also aligns with our public health goal of um, limiting normalization of marijuana use in the eyes of youth. So Joey talked a little bit about the updates to the safe requirement for storage of cannabis and cash overnight for stores. And we've also decided to extend that requirement to hospitality and sales establishments. Um, like stores, hospitalities and sales businesses will store cannabis on the premises overnight. They also have signage that's fairly conspicuous and indicates that they're a marijuana business. And so as a result, they face a similar risk of burglary that stores do and, and should be subject to the same safe requirement as stores. And then a couple of updates to the hospitality bill draft. Um, in the first draft, 6-217B6 uh, um, prohibited a marijuana hospitality business from allowing the use of liquefied petroleum gas within a consumption area. Um, the new draft strikes this prohibition. Um, this is after hearing quite a bit of feedback from stakeholders that the prohibition on the use of LPG would really restrict consumers' ability to ignite their smokable and inhalable marijuana products. Um, our department and the fire department reassessed the need for this prohibition and ultimately decided that the use of LPG in a consumption area um, wouldn't create a significant public safety risk. However, uh, there may be some circumstances where a hospitality business would need a fire operational permit um, in order to have the use of LPG. 
Also in the first draft, um, it was silent on whether mobile hospitality vehicles could have external markings. Um, in the new draft, 6-217C4 um, requires that a mobile marijuana hospitality business shall ensure that the motor vehicle has no external markings, words, or symbols that constitute advertising as defined in section 62041. This change just clarifies that mobile marijuana hospitality businesses are subject to the same advertising restrictions as other marijuana businesses. And again, aligns with our priority of limiting youth exposure to normalization of marijuana consumption. So with that, I will turn it back to Molly to talk about next steps. Great, thanks, Abby and Joey. Um, so just a couple of quick comments on next steps and then we'll jump into the public comment section. Um, so if you want to submit additional written comment, um, the email address is right there where you can send it to. Um, like I said, we'll be going to committee March 2nd. Um, and so, um, you know, the sooner the better you can get it into us so that we can um, have some chance to can make uh, taking that into consideration and make any potential changes. Um, but, you know, we're open to hearing your feedback all the way throughout the process, including the city council legislative process, which has its own kind of separate um, time for public input as well. Uh, there is a template that's available on our website. If you want to provide a public comment using that template, template you're welcome to. It's not required. Um, and so you can either send that template to that marijuana info at denvergov.org or uh, you can go ahead and just uh, freeform it as well. Um, and we're also always open to um, taking meetings or talking with you more and learning more about your feedback, or if you want to hear more about our explanation to the changes, uh, feel free to reach out to that same marijuana info at denvergov.org email, and we'll be happy to set up a meeting with you as well. And then finally, just a little bit about the city council process. Um, so once we feel, well, that the bill is ready to be filed, we will um, be doing that. And like I said, we're scheduled to be at Finance and Governance Committee uh, on March 2nd. And so that is uh, just about two weeks away. Um, and at that time, you know, City Council will have some question time to ask questions, hear the proposal. There will also be time for public comment at that meeting as well. Um, and then the next step after the committee, um, if they approve the bill to move on, to the next step, it goes to a mayor council meeting, which is when both met the mayor and city council members are both present and hear the bill proposals. Um, and again, vote to move them forward. And then finally at city council, there are two readings. Um, the first reading um, is um, the Monday after uh, mayor council. And then the second reading is one week following. Um, so that all of that kind of takes us to the end of March. if. Uh, Every, if we move on past the Finance and Governance Committee on March 2nd. So um, if anybody has any additional questions about the process, we're also happy to take those questions or feedback as well. And I think that's the end of the presentation. So um, if we have some hands raised, we can go ahead and jump into public comment. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A just yet. Um, so feel free to go ahead and raise your hand if you would like to speak and we are happy to um, take your feedback for two minutes each and then um, if there are questions and there's time at the end we can and try to get through those as well or if it's clear as day you all can have an hour and a half back in your evening um, and watch the snowfall All right. Oh, we have a question <laughs> or a comment. Sorry, a comment. Um, all right. So, Samantha? Um, I am promoting Samantha to a panelist so you can turn on video if you want to and unmute yourself. Hello. Thanks for this. Um, I guess I'll turn my video on so you can see my beautiful face in the dark. Um, I just had a couple questions. Um, the uh, 
So the safe requirement that you guys are doing, I understand the need for, um, oh, and I'm representing the Black, Brown, and Red Badged um, organization, which is a bunch uh, a coalition of um, licensees within the cannabis industry who are people of color um, and the Colorado Cannabis Tours um, who will be, you know, working towards mobile hospitality in Denver. Uh, so the safe requirement, um, one does, I missed it and I'm so sorry, does that also re, um, apply to the safe, the off storage um, sites? No, that wouldn't apply to off-premises storage facilities. Okay. And so the idea there is that everybody has to take all their products off the shelves, put them in a safe at night, and then every morning put them all back? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and we adjusted the definition of a safe to also allow for vault rooms and strong rooms if those are um, things that people have or want to implement, um, just as long as they're functionally equivalent to a safe, um, the director can approve them. Okay, and then um, the, the only other thing, uh, the social impact plan, um, because we represent um, social equity licensees um, ex you know, who hope to transition to social equity licensees, um, do we, do we not think that since there's that exclusive period that having such a comprehensive social equity impact plan it might be a little bit too onerous and shouldn't that requirement of a social impact plan be more applicable to existing licensees who've already taken advantage of this market and um, don't necessarily represent that social equity contingent? Um, so that's some good feedback. We hadn't um, heard that piece of feedback before. So that's something we can go back and talk about as a team as to that requirement for social equity applicants. Thank you. And I think that's just sort of, um, you know, as we try to look at the entire scope of what social equity means, you know, it is sort of a, it's a three pronged stool, sort of how we like to exp um, talk about it, where you talk, you know, diversity and inclusion in the workforce, um, you know, giving back to the community, particularly those disproportionately harmed, and of course, market entrance and ownership so um, they can build generational wealth. Um, and so, you know, it just, as we're looking at ways to make it easier for that generational wealth and entrance into the market thing, I, you know, I think it makes a little bit more sense to have those social impact plans a little bit more geared to existing licensees um, who are predominantly white owned and have a pretty big, pretty good lockdown on the market. Um, and, you know, see what we can do to ease the regular ease that requirement around, ex you know, somebody who's already a social equity licensee and probably going to be doing that work anyways. And then finally, the last comment is, um, you know, we once again implore the city to really look at the onerous zoning requirements um, and how those can be um, relaxed a little bit in a more fair manner, particularly um, if you guys are going to be allowing the new dispensary and retail licenses exclusive to social equity licensees. You know, we have to understand that like when you know, I've been around since 2013, almost as long as Ashley, I think, on this issue, but um, you know, the, those, those provisions that were lobbied for um, by the prohibitionists, usually Smart Colorado, um, are what pushed a lot of these dispensaries into oversaturated neighborhoods. And right now, it's so hard to find a new location for dispensaries that if we can look at what Denver looked at with grandfathering when it came to care centers, um, you know, and, and putting medical, you know, sort of grandfathering existing medical marijuana dispensaries into the retail sector, that's sort of what gave us a lot of kissing dispensaries and neighbors and things um, as, a, as, a, as a means to increase opportunity for social equity licensees, because it's just so difficult to find a place. And while we understand COVID, unfortunately, is shutting down, you know, some locations and, and perhaps that commercial real estate's opening up that just from our experience with um, people actively seeking locations, whether it's for hospitality or whether it's for um, a new dispensary, they're just not having any luck because of the owner's restrictions. And so since those licenses are gonna be exclusively offered to social equity licensees, I would suggest that the city look at maybe exempting them from the zoning requirements. Thank you, that's all my time. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we have Smart Colorado next, and I was totally focusing on listen, listening to Samantha and not paying attention to time, um, and we don't have a ton of people with their hands raised, so 
Um, we'll give the next speaker their due time as well to keep it equal, but um, let's just, you know, keep an eye on time to make sure that if there are other people that want to speak that we're, we're giving ample time to everybody. So um, Smart Colorado is the name. I don't know if there's a person behind that, but um, if we want to promote them. Sorry about that. Was it speaking? Um, hi, my name is Henny Lastly. I'm the executive director and one of the co-founders of Smart Colorado. I feel like I must go on the record to clarify that our organization is not a prohibitionist organization. Our organization formed after the passage of Amendment 64 with the intention of making sure since we were the first ones in the U.S. to um, come up with recreational marijuana, that we make sure that our kids are protected and part of the conversation. So Samantha, anytime you wanna give me a call, we can talk about that offline. But um, again, we've been involved in this process with the object, with the uh, opportunity with the city to make sure that, that Denver kids are looked out for. And yes, there was a tremendous push into uh, neighborhoods, but um, again, Honestly, it had to do with zoning from what I understand. I'm not an expert on that. But um, again, we look out to make sure that kids are protected and we appreciate Mayor Hancock's willingness to uh, make sure that we're doing some of those same protections. So um, thanks very much. Samantha, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Penny. Um, so let's see, I don't see anybody else with their hand up, so I can try to read through a couple of the questions that are in the Q&A and see if we can answer them. Um, the first question was around delivery licenses being restricted to dispensaries and third parties. Um, and, and the question is, does this draft include licenses for independent delivery businesses? And if so, are there any specific outlines for how we conduct businesses? Um, so the proposal includes um, transporter licenses, uh, which would be exclusively available to social equity applicants for a period of six years. Um, and then those transporters that are, uh, qualify as social equity applicants would be able to conduct delivery for three years and before stores, existing stores and centers would be able to conduct direct consumer delivery. They would be required to work through a transporter for those first three years. Um, so hopefully that answers the questions. The specific outlines for how business is conducted by those independent delivery businesses um, would be all the requirements that are set by state statute and, and MED rules, as well as, as all the delivery requirements in our proposed ordinance as well. So um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next, question is, um, is there any discussion on change of changing the restriction on current license holders being able to offer delivery? Um, why not? Shouldn't current license holders who know their product and process best be able to own their own delivery? Um, so this is a big piece of the social equity proposal. Uh, and so we are proposing that stores and centers work with a transporter. And so if there is a particular, um, you know, information about a particular product or something that a store holds, um, having a contract with a transporter um, and having that close relationship or the transporter would be the way to conduct that delivery and, um, you know, share that information about their product. And Abby or Joey or any, Reggie, feel free to jump in if I'm missing any points as well. Um, so the next question is, have you completed an analysis of where these new grow and retail sites would be allowed? Have you determined possible total number of new storefronts and grow operations? So we do plan to post a map on our website this week that will show, um, it's a general large, you know, big picture map of the city for where, what areas are still eligible for a new store license and for a hospitality license. Um, so we can definitely send out some information or keep an eye on our website this week for that, those maps to be posted online. 
It's not going to tell you the total number of new storefronts and grow locations um, or tell you a site specific information about whether a specific site is eligible or not. Um, you know, that, that would be a one by one analysis, a case by case analysis to determine, you know, if a specific site is eligible and if it's available for rent um, or for lease or purchase. Um, and so that's not, you know, that level of detail is not available in this analysis, but it is a good big picture map, high level of what areas in the city are still eligible. Um, it takes into consideration the zoning restrictions as, um, you know, the biggest piece of the puzzle as to where businesses are able to locate. Um, and then it also can, takes into considering the licensing buffers. Um, let's see, are there any hands raised or should I keep going? <laughs> no hands raised at the moment. Okay. Um, oh, well, there's lots of questions in here. So people, let's see. Um, so one question, oh, go ahead. No, that's okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the questions is, yeah. will there be assistance or a credit program for the upfront license and legal fees? A typical retainer for a marijuana focused firm is $5,000. Um, that's a good question. Um, as far as the license fees, we, uh, Joey touched on earlier about how we are um, waiving application fees for social equity applicants, and then the license fees for social equity applicants are uh, half those of the are fifty percent reduced from the license fees for um, non social equity applicants, um, and that's at the city level. The state has their own fee structure um, that they require from licensees, and then um, we are working with. Um, some other city agencies to um, work on ways to provide uh, technical assistance to social equity applicants. Um, and hopefully we'll have more to, to come on that soon. Um, in the meantime, we've heard from some law firms that they are going to do some pro bono work for social equity applicants. So I'd, I'd encourage you to sort of look around and see who might be offering pro bono services um, in the meantime. And then the state is also working on a technical assistance program for social equity applicants um, pending approval by the General Assembly this legislative session. All right. Um, and it looks like it's, it's hard to keep track of all these questions that are happening in the chat, but it did, I did. Joey did chime in and say he thinks he could answer Virginia's question. So I'll keep looking through other questions if you want to go ahead and answer that one, Joey. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Virginia. So I think that what you're asking about, Virginia, is related to some restrictions on transfers of location for co located licenses. And um, in that example of uh, perhaps a store located with a grow, um, we're maintaining provisions that would restrict the ability for those co-located licenses um, to split and create new locations. While we are removing the, the license, um, while we are recommending or proposing that we would remove the license cap, um, we considered this really carefully that for all of these co-located licenses um, in, in spaces where a retail marijuana store and a retail marijuana grow are co-located, if each of those locations in the city were able to split their locations and create new locations, um, it, it would very quickly, um, you know, possibly double the number of locations we have for some of those co-located licenses. And so um, wanting to keep an eye on, I think really thoughtful growth of the industry by allowing for, for new licenses and locations for social equity licensees while maintaining those provisions were a priority for us. Um, so there, it, the new ordinances, um, the proposed ordinances would still maintain that if you have those co-located licenses um, they would not be able to split locations if it were going to create um, without, to your point, Virginia, without surrendering the co-located license or without moving all of the licenses to a new location. 
there are a couple of other provisions there, but um, you know, once you get into some of the the specifics of licensing situations, um, you're always free to reach out to me and we can chat more about what that could look like. Okay, um, so there's also a couple of questions in here about the removing of the caps on the number of stores and grows. And if we have received comments about, from Deborah residents for removal of a store or grow. Um, and so uh, a couple of things that I'll address there um, are that uh, so a, a business can be required can can be re a community member or it, it can be requested that a business um, have to have a renewal hearing um, if it's if there's you know certain uh, causes for that and and those are made evident to the department we can require a business to have a renewal hearing be held um, they don't happen very often. Um, it's, and they have to happen as a result of, um, of you know, a negative impact on uh, public health, safety, and welfare. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, we receive the number of complaints that we receive for marijuana businesses has drastically decreased over the last couple of years. Um, and so I wouldn't say necessarily that we get requests for removal of stores and grows, but we do address complaints and handle those as needed. Um, and the reason to remove all the limits on the numbers of stores and grows um, is because we're replacing that mechanism for distributing licenses with the exclusivity for the social equity licenses. One of the mechanisms that we were, or the mechanism to distribute licenses under the cap was a lottery system. And that lottery system uh, presented some barriers to entry for social equity applicants. Um, and so given the more limited pool of applicants, we're replacing that, we, we're removing the lottery and the cap and replacing that with the exclusivity. Um, the last question on this topic um, was what does trigger a, a hearing for a license renewal and can the director choose to not hold a hearing? Um, and so I don't know if Reggie wants to chime in here um, and we can also share out the uh, section of the ordinance that states the causes for a renewal hearing as well as the causes for denial. Um, if you want to hop in, Reggie, or if we can just share the citation of that um, section of the ordinance for the causes of a renewal hearing. Yeah, and I'm just noticing how dark it is in my room. She's, uh, <laughs> it looks nice, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that is currently in, I believe, the newest version of 6222. Um, and I'm trying to open that up right now. And while Reggie's doing that, since I've been at Excise um, 2016, we also have this provision for liquor. And I think, um, I think I've only had maybe two requests over the period of time. One time it wound up being about you know, 70 neighbors requesting the renewal hearing, so I granted it. And then the neighbors got together with the business owner and they worked out their issues and we didn't even have to have the hearing. And then another time I've had you know, one or two neighbors requested and then not granted it because there were so few people requesting that and asked them to discuss with the business owner themselves because it's always better if the neighbors can work directly with the business and come to a solution rather than us getting involved. Yeah, and the way that it's currently written, it would be, it's a, it's a may. So the director always has that discretion. I believe that we've worked through our policies and procedures, different uh, mechanisms for requesting that hearing be it a certain amount of signatures that a person would submit to request that hearing and the reason and stating the reasons that are for. Um, but it is a, at this point in May. So it's something that the director would receive information on why a person is requesting that hearing and then make the determination on whether or not a, a renewal hearing is appropriate. And I'd say also the two requests I've received in five years have only been related to liquor. Right, Reggie? I think so. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I think the last renewal hearing that I can think of that we had, uh, actually there, there, there was one that was before it was a medical marijuana center um, mm -hmm. that had a renewal hearing, but that was based on um, adverse impacts on the neighborhood. And I, I believe that was maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago. 
Uh, there is a comment in the in the chat or in the question and answer about um, social impact plans and um, you know that requirement for social equity applicants and would the city provide assistance to, to licensees in this process? Uh, and we do plan on creating a template for social impact plans that businesses, you know, that it will basically be a part of the application for you know for if, for a new license as well as renewal and so that we are hoping will provide some pretty clear guidance to businesses and applicants around what needs to be included in their social impact plan so um and that is something we'd be happy to take input on as well um, one of the questions in the q a is are there any outlines for how those independent companies may upcharge for their services talking about transporters who are conducting deliveries on behalf of stores. Um, the answer is no, not in our ordinance. We, we aren't proposing any sort of guidelines for what those companies can charge. Um, this is a brand new market for us, and I don't think we have enough information to make a limitation on what transporters could charge um, stores for conducting deliveries. And I think that'll just come down to the contracts between the companies. Okay, so I think that I've tried to group the questions together if there was a theme, and I think we've addressed most of them. But again, um, if there is a specific question or comment that you would like to provide, please go ahead and send it to the marijuana info at denvergov.org. Um, and if anybody else wants to still provide public comment, we can stick around for another minute or so to see if anybody else raises their hand. Um, any, any closing thoughts or any other things that I'm missing from the rest of the team that you guys would like to highlight? Oh, it looks like we have a, a hand raised now. We have Graydon Washington. Graydon, I'm promoting you to a panelist. Hey team, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, I had a comment and also a question on red line four in section 6223 under causes for denial. And I, I guess I'll start with my comment, how I read it. Uh, it looks like if a new applicant, which in Denver is gonna be a social equity applicant, applied for more than one license, um, the, the city would determine if uh, that would restrain competition. And I guess I would just mention, I would guess I would just comment that um, uh, I think that's, that's very limiting for the social equity applicant, especially if they want to have a vertical business model. And then uh, also, I just think generally it's kind of out of place for the city. But I'm also look, uh, seeking for you know clarification, explanation. Uh, I saw on that slide, I kind of had a different viewpoint than what I was thinking, but uh, I haven't been able to access that slide. It's not on the presentation um, that was given. Thank you. Yeah, so that you're right, that is a new slide that we just added today based on a couple of conversations that we've had over the last day or so about people um, reacting to that language. So um, it is for new applicants or to for an additional or new license, it's not on renewals. Um, and then it also is existing language that is in our ordinance today, as well as in the state code. Um, so it's not a new criteria that we would be taking into consideration. It is something that already exists and exists in state code as well. Uh, so Abby or Reggie, you guys want to expand on that at all? No, I, I think that that's, that's an accurate statement. Yeah, and I, you know, I was just looking over some stuff, you know, in Colorado liquor, we don't allow until very recently one person to own more than one liquor licenses. Marijuana was given the option to allow that. And so what the state law did is it added some caveat that was as long as there was not any, whatever that term is, unfair uh, competition. So that's kind of where that came, but that's an area where marijuana, where, where liquor is regulated more strictly than marijuana. And this is just kind of part of that, allowing that to happen. 
allowing an individual to own more than one licenses, but making sure there's not that undue, uh, you know, what a undue competition. Did you have a, another question, Graydon? Yeah, I'm still confused, but I'll articulate it in the email uh, through public comic that way. Um, I guess uh, if I had another question was, I, I noticed that Denver, uh, I believe passed the five-star certification program. I know it doesn't have to do with this draft, but I guess, um, is, that going, is that going to be for cannabis businesses as well? Will they be able to participate in that um, uh, certificate program? Um, yes, it, that's open to all businesses, but I'm wondering, does it impact you guys right now since you're an essential business? Yeah, I guess the capacity still impacts you. But yeah, is, that five-star program is open to all businesses. Um, Molly, are you? I, I don't think we've had any marijuana businesses apply. I mean, of the, of the applicants, we've had about 300, almost 400 applicants, like 70% of them are restaurants because they are the ones that have been sort of primarily the most negatively impacted, but we, we haven't had many retail applications. We've had some gyms. So it's probably been more uh, uh, restaurants and gyms, but I, I think definitely you guys would be allowed to. I just don't think maybe retail is not seeing the need for it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Braden. Okay, um, Nancy Grandis jones uh, has her hand up. I'm going to promote you to a panelist so you can turn on video if you'd like. There. Got it. Hello, everybody. And guess what? I don't have any questions or comments about SIPs but I'm back on <laughs> trying to under, and I really do appreciate, I think the presentations have been fabulous that you've been doing. I'm trying to understand this mobile hospitality and I just joined in. So I don't know if you had that as part of your presentation today. So um, bear with me if this is all old news. For the um, licensures for that mobile hospitality, is that just for social equity applicants or is that for anybody? Only social equity applicants would be allowed to apply for those licenses until July 2027. Oh, okay. Um, then the other question is just trying to understand this. And I have to say, I haven't gone back into the ordinance to read, uh, to read about it. How does that, uh, how is this thing gonna work? Like people will be in a vehicle and go anywhere in the city with, you know, it's kind of like a food truck for marijuana. Is that what it is? No, so you can't have sales on mobile hospitality premises. And oh. so there wouldn't be any purchase of marijuana would be one thing why it's not like a food truck. Um, and so it'd probably be more like um, a shuttle or a tour bus. Um, that would take consumers from like one, you know, destination to another or around to different destinations throughout the city. And they would be allowed to consume um, on the bus or, you know, vehicle in between those destinations. And I say bus because it does require that um, there be separation between the driver and the consumers. And so, um, I mean, it, I guess it could be a smaller vehicle, but there does, there is that requirement for the separation. Um, and there is a requirement in our ordinance that those businesses have to uh, identify the, their route and their stops and their starts. Okay. Um, and so those would be submitted with us. And there are some prohibited locations from where they can stop and, you know, get on and get off. And those are the same as our proximity restrictions like schools and daycares and drug and alcohol treatment facilities. Right. Okay. And that, yeah, are there any other in the ordinance? Um, any other specified restrictive places? I, and for example, okay, you know, I'm gonna think about the National Western Center because, you know, that's, that's a biggie there in GES. Would these tour buses be able to make stops 
on those, you know, on those streets, which are public streets, um, going through the National Western Center, for example. So they would be required to uh, um, obey with all other traffic and parking laws that are required. So if there is a, if a, a non a marijuana consumption bus, whatever rules they have to follow, um, these buses would be required to follow them as well. So if, if buses are allowed to stop there, then um, this, these buses would be allowed to stop there. I, there's no restriction from them stopping outside a liquor license or anything like that. So. Okay. And um, the only other thing is they can't, they can't stay stationary for more right. than 30 minutes and still allow for consumption. Um, so they're not going to come park at the National Western Center um, and hang out for two hours and allow, you know, on and off of the bus for those two hours. But they could be, you know, hey, people come from out of town, they could be bringing people to the um, stock show or any other events that are that would be at the National Western Center. It's like a shuttle service with smoke and marijuana or eating edibles on the bus. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for that clarification. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next person with their hand raised is Miles Tangelin. I'm going to, oh, where'd you go? you to a panelist. Oops. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for doing the presentation. I'm still getting caught up on um, what's happening here. I, I sat through the INC presentation. So, um, uh, a lot of new things, um, but I think my biggest question is using this equity lens, um, it sounds like this program is incentivizing the expansion of retail and marijuana grows throughout all parts of the city because you had mentioned um, it's, it's right now in certain neighborhoods, but now you're going to require it to be spread out throughout the city with the new licenses. So I guess my question would be is, uh, you've mentioned you've done outreach. Um, how, I mean, with that expansion happening everywhere, do you feel the RNOs have enough input that the residents know that what's happening, the license caps being removed, grow operations might be popping up around the city. Um, I'm just wondering, how clear that's been and, and have you gotten any feedback about that? Are our residents even aware of it? You know, we've got over 800,000 people in the city. Um, so yeah, if you can touch on that. So there are similar, or, you know, a lot of the protections that are in place right now uh, through the cap will remain in place. Uh, so one of the protections that's there that will continue is that the neighborhoods, um, the top five neighborhoods with the most cultivation facilities and the top five neighborhoods with the most stores uh, will be prohibited from getting additional locations. So those top five neighborhoods will be set uh, within 90 days of this proposal if it passes, and then it would be reset in uh, each year thereafter. And so no new locations would be able to go into those, lo those neighborhoods. Um, additionally, when we post those maps that I mentioned later this week, you'll see um, it is not, um, I mean, there are, there are neighborhoods where these businesses are still not able to go. Um, and a lot of that is based on zoning. And that is, you know, for retail stores, that is where other retail businesses aren't able to go either, although there are a few additional limitations for marijuana stores. Um, and so that will, I think, help you identify the neighborhoods that I think that uh, where additional locations might be able to locate. Um, anything yeah. else on that that piece? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'll just jump in, Miles. Thanks for that question. That's so important because, as we know, a lot of times, you know, the industry that's being regulated will be at the table, or people who might have strong feelings about whatever's being regulated might be more likely to be at the table. So what we did, we wanted to be sure that we had community voices at the table. And when we did our marijuana licensing work group, I think we kind of did about, you know, 
one fourth industry, one fourth public health, one fourth uh, city representatives, and one fourth community people. So that was a couple. That was a couple of months ago. We sent out a call for applications for people to apply to be on the work group, and we sent it to all the RNOs. We had a couple of applicants. We had a couple of different people that were on the work group, one woman from RNO and then a couple of other people that kind of covered public health and community as well. And we had DPS involved. Um, so I think, you know, if you know of somebody who feels like they want, Anna, I mean, how many Molly we've had, you know, now most recently these five feedback sessions, but even before that, over the last couple of years, we've done, um, what do you even call them? Public meetings, we've done, multiple different things, but if you've got additional people you'd like us to reach out to, let us know, we'll definitely do it. Um, we did one recent feedback session that was really just directed at community, because we know sometimes community might feel a little intimidated talking in front of other people at times. And then I think you guys, our team went to INC uh, just recently and did a big presentation, but we still, we've got a couple of weeks before committee so any um, ideas or anybody you'd like us to reach out to, let us know, and we're happy to do that. And as you know, everything's kind of on the website too, so that can give people uh, a, a jump start before we have a direct conversation with them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I think what I've been finding, um, and it's not just your department, it's the planning department, um, these things are rolled together into these very complex um, presentations and and this one's quite technical mm -hmm. and it, it's just difficult to get people to know what's happening and and they just don't want to spend the time to actually learn about it because and and there's so many plans coming out rolling out from the city and there's more in the future that I, I just wonder on the timeline if maybe more time could be given to just kind of let it gel with the um, public and allow people to kind of learn about it so you can really get some good feedback. That's all because, you know, it's dropped and then it's being reviewed, then it passes and then people go, what's going on in my neighborhood? Why is this happening? So that would be my only comment. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for that feedback. As we go, so we've got a couple of weeks before we get our first committee meeting. And then after that, we, you know, it's it's like another a number of weeks before, you know, council will even vote on it. So we've got some time, um, you know, and I think probably you can, uh, Molly, we've probably got all of our contact information somewhere, or, or I can put it in the chat, but feel free to reach out to us. Let us know who you'd like to talk to about this, because you're right, it is um, it is complicated and there's a lot of moving pieces, you know, and people who've been following this for however many years are more, um, you know, they're more aware of what's going on and they more easily understand all the nuances, but let us know how we can help and we're happy to schedule some time with you and anybody else that you'd like us to. All right. Um, so that that is it for questions in the Q and A, as well as people with their hands hands raised. Um, so I'll give it just one more minute or so, and maybe Abby, if you want to go ahead and share your screen again, and we can put up the slide with our our email address of where you can send your written comment, as well as where you can send an email if you want to request that we come to a meeting. If you are with an RNO. Um, or have an organization you'd like us to come speak to, we are always happy to come and speak to those organizations um, to provide more information or answer questions. Um, and that goes for any time. It doesn't have to be just during this legislative process. We are also, you know, if it passes and there are questions or if you have concerns that you want to talk about, even non-marijuana related, but are licensing related, we're happy to come out and speak with you. All right, um, still not seeing any additional hands raised. So we will go ahead and adjourn here, um, but feel free to reach out anytime. And again, like Ashley said, thank you so much for your comments and your feedback. We really do value it and we really do take it all into consideration as we develop our final proposal. Um, so thanks again. Thanks everyone, see ya. All right, take care.